where uh, Sarah Miller approached me and asked if uh, we could come back and revisit some things about the schoolhouse. And uh, I'm going to go over a few things on the schoolhouse and about uh, schools in general. But while I'm going over the first few things about the histories of schools in uh, Yamhill County, I'm just going to go have in the background uh, the moving of the school. And so I've got the sound off. And uh, let's see, that should go. And that's just going to be showing some of the stuff with the moving of the school. The first schoolhouse in uh, Yamhill County uh, was built in 1844. And that may seem like it's a pretty long time, but the first schoolhouse in Oregon was about 10 years earlier uh, than that. That schoolhouse was about 1.5 miles northwest of what was called the village of Lafayette. And it was a log structure. And as all one-room schoolhouses, any schoolhouse early on was more than just a place to go to learn. It was a place for your social and your religious gatherings, too. So they really were a center for the area, for the community, and they were uh, well used uh, with that. In 1854, uh, there was a reorganization of school districts uh, in the county of Yamhill and uh, by John R. McBride. And he actually was the son of James McBride, who was the first superintendent of public instruction for the Oregon Territories. So it kind of makes a little bit of a, a difference with what's going on with, uh, with his father being what it, with what he was. With this reorganization actually came a permanent numbering of the school districts in Yamhill County. Now, you guys might be thinking, oh, that just means that if we get a low-numbered school, it's an old school. It doesn't mean that at all. Because if a school district was uh, disbanded, the number got reused. So a low number did not necessarily mean it was an old district. In uh, 1872, at the state, there was actually a law that created the State Board of Education. And uh, between... 1872 and 1941, that board was the superintendent of public instruction, the governor, and the secretary of state. Now we've got, I have no idea how many buildings worth of people are involved with that, with uh, teacher certification and everything else. That initial board had the power to authorize the use of textbooks, prescribe rules for schools, uh, you could uh, sit as a board of examiners uh, to grant a life diploma or a certificate for a teacher. You could grant a diploma or a certificate to people from other states, providing they had some sort of authentic uh, diploma or certificate. And very importantly was revoke diplomas or certifications for immoral or unprofessional conduct. Now, you may have seen some of the different rules that they've had out there. The ones that are going from 1872 are, uh, well, they don't know that they're valid. We do have uh, something online saying that, oh, these were the rules that were used and established for Boston School. Um, excuse me, Bel uh, Bellevue. No, Boston School. And it's not, uh, and that's one of those schools actually is still there. It's uh, used for a little museum out in the community of uh, uh, Ballston. But that's the exact same rules as they had elsewhere. But the gist of it is, you know, teachers had a lot of responsibilities. that They'd be delegating things to students and uh, uh, those sorts of things, too. So, you know, fill, fill lamps, trim wicks, clean chimneys, uh, bring your water, scuttle of coal for the day sessions. Usually you delegate that to one of your students to be doing. But very importantly, it says, make your pens carefully. Whittle nibs to the individual taste of the people. So were teachers hired because they could make good, good uh, quill tips. So making a good quill tip was very important, as was being able to write pretty. Men teachers could go, you know, take some time to go courting one evening a week or two evening a week if they attend church regularly. And, you know, if you spend 10 hours at school, you can spend the rest of the time reading the Bible or other good books. And women teachers who marry or engage in unseemly conduct would be dismissed. And you know that could probably be about anything if they wanted to, to call it that. But you've got to remember, 
your teacher probably boarded with you or your family, and so you know you had pretty close tabs on what that teacher was doing. Um, any teacher who smokes, uses liquor, frequents public uh, public pool pool or public halls, who gets shaved in a barber shop, um, gives good cause to suspect their worth, integrity, uh, intention, and their honesty. So you know that could be considered behavior not becoming. But those were the sorts of things. Things improved by 1915, though. Um, you couldn't marry if you were a woman during the term of your contract. If you were a man, you could. You couldn't keep company with men if you were a woman. And you had to be home between 8 and 6. 8 p.m. and 6 a.m., unless you were at a school function. Church function, they'd probably let you get away with. You could not loiter downtown if, you had a, if there was an ice cream shop in that town. You couldn't travel beyond the city limits unless you had permission of the chairman of the school board. You couldn't ride in carriages or automobiles, except for your father or brother. Um, couldn't smoke cigarettes. If you're a woman, you couldn't dress in bright colors. You could not dye your hair. And you must wear at least two petticoats. And your dresses could not be any shorter than two inches above the ankles. So that changed really quick, I think, when you went into the 20s. And of course you had to keep your classroom clean, scrub the floor, wash the blackboards, and you of course would delegate students to do a lot of those tasks for you. Why they were so well educated. <laughs> so, oops. Okay, so in 1891, uh, the superintendent of Yamhill County, uh, did, he filed a report on the state of the schools in our district. And at that time, we had 76 districts. And the Baker's Report, District 15, the Woods Hutchcroft, which is what we have here. Uh, the schoolhouse in 15 is pleasantly situated west of North Yam Hill. It is a good building and well furnished. Miss Agnes Armberg taught the spring term, and Miss Josie Shearer taught the fall. Now, the late Miss Helen Sharp was the one whom uh, we ended up with uh, access. She had access to many of the early records of the founding and things on the school. So the schools of Old Yam Hill, um, which you can go by at the Lafayette site, um, owed a lot of the information uh, on uh, the Hutchcroft School to that. So the school that we have, not actually the school that we have, but the district from which our school represents, uh, was originally formed by a meeting by the legal voters, so that's only men at that time, held on October 14th, 1854, at the home of Caleb Woods. And by March 55, the site for the school was determined to be on the Woods Place along the Tillamook Trail. So those who wanted to go on the Tillamook Trail, well, the ride it was up on the road for there. And the original building that was used for the school there was raised by the people of the district, and it got finished by Mr. E. Washburn, and he got paid $10 for his work. Thomas Cox was one of the very first teachers in the district, and he began teaching in April of 1856. By 1877, they determined that they needed to build a new school because that old one was just too small. John Hutchcroft gave the district it's one acre of land on a knoll just southeast of his home. And here a framed schoolhouse of 20 feet by 36 feet was constructed. By the 1930s, enrollment though was low, and by 1933 to 34, there was only 12 children who attended, 34 to 35. There was down to eight, that was taught by Bernice Martin. And the last teacher was Florence Johnson. And that was the 35, 36. She only had four pupils. And then they uh, suspended school there. The students were transported to Yam Hill at the district's expense. And you had the complete consolidation uh, in 1946, even though the, uh, the school was sold prior to that. I'll go into that in a little bit. In 1919, Jim and Daisy Whitlow they purchased the farm that was adjoining the Hutchcroft School. And when the acre of the school, which was set upon, was put up for sale, or put up for auction, it was a public auction, in 1941, they purchased the land. 
Now, at the same time, the school, when it was being used, it was still used for a community building and everything else. And the Sunshine Club, which was a women's group, had been meeting there since the early 20s. And they wanted to continue meeting there. So before the school acre was sold, the building got dragged across the property line onto the property owned by Mr. Woods, which has me wondering, because I don't know if this is the same Caleb Woods property that was next to the Hutchcroft property or not, but it may have been. Um, and it was drug over there. And it was just a tiny sliver of property, did not have easy access. So uh, Mr. Woods gave that to the Sunshine Club. And uh, they continued to meet there uh, for quite a long time, until actually the till late 80s. In the early 1920s, Lester and Gertrude Rice Daniels, they rented the Whitman Farm across the road from Hedgecroft School. Polly Daniels was one of the founders of the Sunshine Club. And the Sunshine Club finally sold the school and the land to Raymond Whitlow in 1991. And uh, Raymond Whitlow was Jim and Daisy Whitlow's grandson. Now, they were loggers in that area. And uh, Jim and Daisy Whitlow had five children. They all attended Hutchcroft School. Uh, there was Kenneth, Leonard, Robert, Crystal, and Clifford. For many years, the Whitlow boys were responsible for crossing the field and building the fire in the school, so it would be warm when the teacher and students arrived. The whole Whitlows were involved in one way or another with logging back in the era of steam logging. And one of their friends, a Mr. White from Portland, North, North Portland, came to spend some time with them. And he asked how loggers were able to fire up the boilers so quickly to bring them up to steam when they're arriving at a logging site in the morning. The boys told him that they would show him that when they went over to build the fire at the school in the morning. <laughs> the following morning, they went to the school, and the Whitlow boys showed them how to seek out wood that was the pitchiest wood, how to split it really, really fine, and layer it with the pitch, and then to add the larger pieces on top and so when they lit the fire, you know, the flame's going to completely surround everything and it's just going to take off at a roaring good, uh, roaring good rate. So they lit the fire and they adjusted the stove and chimney dampers for maximum draft to nurse the fire. And uh, the visitors saw very quickly how that fire could get a lot of heat out there and then they went home for their breakfast before returning to school. Well, about that time, somebody glances out the window of the kitchen, and there are flames shooting 15, 20 feet out of the chimney. The boys, of course, have not even sat down to go eat yet. And uh, the family goes rushing across the field into the school. The stove was glowing white hot in the room, and the fender around the stove was glowing red. Now, dampers were quickly closed to starve the fire from oxygen, and they threw a bucket of water on the floor to keep it from igniting, and the family returned home, leaving the boys to stay in guard until the teacher and students arrived. That stove was a Waterbury furnace, and uh, there's a, we will eventually, we actually have that stove that's up at Lafayette. Um, it needs to be having some uh, uh, restoration do, uh, work done on it and some encapsulation of the asbestos that's in the double layer of the fender around there, and uh, some paint work done on that to have it back to what it should have looked like, which would have been a very shiny uh, black. No doubt that that paint kind of burned off when it was uh, <laughs> glowing white hot and uh, red. So um, my hope is that we'll actually have that stove uh, back in there. Yeah, well, Harvest Fest is probably uh, uh, more reasonable with as busy as I am lately. But you never know. I might get it there by, uh, by Farm Fest. So, We've had a, a long history, and we ended up with getting the school uh, coming to us. We had, um, you saw how it was getting here, and then once it got here, let me go close this one here, and <coughs> some sound on, close, and uh, we ended up with a, uh, okay, we ended up with the, uh, uh, getting a grant for some of the finished work of the school, getting the bell tower and getting our, our faux chimney up there. Uh, and uh, so we had a grant to help with some of that from uh, the Yamhill County uh, Cultural Coalition. 
And so this was a little presentation that we gave to them, um, or we showed to them. Come on, click. Open. Excuse me a second. And so we've got it back to the original colors. The schools, of course, all had the windows down low, so you could rest your eyes on an urban or a sylvan scene going through there. And those were all the way schools were constructed and what they enjoyed with it. Now the side door there uh, was not, that was originally a window, a door was put in there where it was actually used as a school. Um, we widened that to make the ADA door, which we have uh, for accessing through that. Um, if you're able to go in there and look in the front right corner back by that first window, you can see a chunk of floor that was replaced. That was an approximate area that Waterbury Furnace uh, which got so hot that that stove uh, was located. So you can sort of have a pretty good idea where they replaced the floorboards, which I think got a little charred. And then the teacher platform had gotten removed, and so we ended up replacing uh, the teacher platform um, and utilizing that. We had many thanks for the uh, installation and a lot of uh, uh, time by uh, Vince Haworth for putting that together and uh, working on that and getting it blocked so we don't get the bell stuck upside down, which happened quite a few times. And as we had the chimney bricks and we wanted something lighter weight because there's a slight bow on the back of the school because there was so much weight with the chimney, uh, we removed the chimney except for what you can see on the inside portion and then we just have a little chunk set up on top on there but all of those bricks were slabbed into uh, pieces from the original bricks. The outhouse is also another uh, addition. Sorry, it's not a three-seater. If you see Shirley Venhouse, she really wanted a three-seater. <laughs> but we at least have something, and kids do like to take pictures uh, with the... Uh... So that was... Uh... And it works. So, you know, please take a look at the schoolhouse, and if you want to go out there and take a peek, it's open. We now also have a uh, flagpole out there, which the kids at Pioneer Days uh, peeled this last spring. And the kids in Pioneer Day Camp actually were also doing some graffiti on the flagpole. And uh, they didn't, you know, we had to explain to them was how you did graffiti back then. So we've got some initials and things carved in there. And uh, the flag that is flying is an 1880 flag. So it's going to look a little bit different than, uh, than the other ones. Do you guys have any questions? Yes? All the desks that were in there originally? Uh, all better, of okay. course. The, are the desks that are in there now, do they have any significance? Okay, the Vince Haworth uh, made the desks that are in there. They're, the original desks, a lot of people think of the, and at one point that building did have the scrolled iron uh, work desks, but those weren't coming into play until we're getting into uh, late 1890s for when those things, many of those were patented. So uh, we've got a desk that's going to be uh, more similar to the sort of benches that they would have had. And speaking of desks, the first desk we had in there for the teacher, uh, all we know is that came from uh, an elevator by Dayton. And then we had a desk that was used from the Happy Valley School though it was in uh, considerable, uh, okay, the back was missing and it had a lot of work that needed to be done on it. My husband did the restoration work and uh, uh, manufactured the pieces that were missing. Fortunately, it's similar to a teacher desk that we have upstairs in uh, 
our library that's also out of oak. And then uh, Alan Steinke also helped with uh, some of the piece manufacturing. So we have a desk that was actually used in Yamhill County uh, as a teacher's desk uh, in there. That was give, donated to us by Lauren Zest. They had uh, the schoolhouse that they had um, lived in had been uh, transformed into a house when they were younger. And uh, the desk sort of got carted off and shoved up into an attic area. And uh, they, I just had this hopes that it was going to be something that was, it just looked like a piece of junk. But we had the history, we were able to get it working so it's functioning. And so it's nice to have a desk that we know for a fact was in use in Yanhill County and it was leased from another school in there. So uh, that's what we know about with the, with the desks. And uh, if you're ever going in there and you see smoke, there's fire extinguishers by both doors, but one is camouflaged by a shirt and one's camouflaged by a cloak. <laughs> Any more questions? So, yes. So the outhouse looks authentic. Did you, did you, did you say who gave or donated it? Uh, my husband built the outhouse. Uh, some of the boys here, or I should say the men on the Wednesday crew, who I just call the boys, yeah. uh, they uh, you know helped put a few things together with it. And uh, you know, if you're opening it up and you're going in there, I've even got old newspapers mm -hmm. that okay, they're modern newspapers, but they look like they're from like 1880s that are cut up for you know some toilet paper in there because they didn't have a spare you know, Sears and Roebuck or Monkey Ward catalog to leave in there. And we have plexiglass to discourage somebody from using it. But uh, <laughs> just, a lot of kids really like that for a photo op. Mm -hmm. They think that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, should be two though, one for the boys and one for the girls. So thank you very, oh yes, So with the, with the fall and the spring pioneer days, mm -hmm. how many kids actually come out here about each year and how old are they and where from? We've uh, had kids come from uh, actually all over from uh, uh, Washington County through uh, Lynn, Benton, Marion County and Yamhill County but because of uh, we're trying to restrict primarily to uh, Yamhill County now and to uh, around the uh, the, you know, the other schools that are right near the border. A lot of that is because it's not fair to our volunteers if the school gets here late and, and such. The program um, is, uh, was also, for going to a comparable, I mean we were, we were just about, with what we were charging was like covering costs for materials and things and wasn't taking into account insurance and other stuff and you know electricity and means for being able to uh, keep the the program you know running continuously so uh, uh, we've upped the the cost now to I believe four dollars a student and uh, we've got a full schedule for for the fall but we're also trying to restrict it to about 50 to 60 kids maximum a day attending because it's much easier and much better if we can keep them. I'm sorry, I don't need these on anymore because I'm not reading. We, we want to have them, to, you know, if you've got a group of eight, they can get a lot more one on one, hands on uh, interactions, which is much more valuable uh, for, their, for their learning. And speaking of uh, quilting, they're going to be finishing up uh, tying a quilt that they started, going back with uh, back. Oh gosh, I'm having a horrible senior moment. And I can't read from Jean. When Jean was starting with doing quilting with little blocks from the leftover scraps of the uh, of the costumes that the kids have, and does it? Whoever was whoever was working with that. I just. I mean, I know you were because I was working with you with the cabin area, and we ended up finishing a quilt with that. We ended up using you know some other. We didn't. The backing wasn't big enough, so. But the kids had to go sew the whole backing together to make the block big enough. And then, you know, getting the edges done, and it's just getting it all laid out. And then they've been starting to go get it tied. It's almost finished with the tying. And then we still have got more blocks, and we're going to have them make another one. And uh, they really are, uh, you know, they can come back. And it's like, I put a shingle on the shed out there, nailed them on there. And, 
you know, I carved this on the schoolhouse, or I peeled this pole, or helped with that. And you, you, it ties the young people in with something that they've done here that they can come back and see. So that's really, really important. And it also gives them a little inkling on, you know, some of the history and things in, involved and what life was like. So, uh, third, third grade? Oh, they're, third uh, yeah, they're, they're usually around fourth grade. Third to fourth grade is when they're doing the curriculum. Uh, we do have other groups come through for uh, field trips and things. Uh, but we're geared, you know, really much more towards anywhere between third to sixth grade in that range. Um, but when we've had high school groups come through here during that time, we focus things a little differently. Um, and that's usually just a small group coming through. It's not going to be a whole Pioneer Days experience. Um, so it's, uh, we have a good time. I think most of our volunteers have a good time who are, who are out here. They, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. We wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun. <laughs> How many did you have last year? Um, last year, I think about 1,100. We've, we've had close to 1,200. Um, you know, it kind of all depends. Pioneer Day Camp, I think we had eight or 10 uh, for that one coming through there. Previous year, we had eight in Pioneer Day Camp. We really just want to keep that for maybe around that 10 range, 12 maximum type because you know, the garden looked a lot better this year than it did last year because the kids are taking responsibility and helping with that. And um, they give a lot out in the summer and, and stuff too. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good program. So. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take off. I'll be, be going back to my farm. I'm going to leave the schoolhouse open. They've got baseball that's going to be starting in just a little bit for some practicing for throwing the ball around. And then I'll be back to go lock up the schoolhouse. So don't worry about the schoolhouse for those who are here. <laughs> what did you say about practicing baseball? Uh, he's already out there. Yeah. There's some folks running around the ball field now. So they're getting ready for a couple weeks from now. All right. Thank you, Cynthia. That was great. Um, don't. Uh, I don't see coffee donation pots on the table, but I'm sure that Farrell will take. Sorry, I forgot. That's that's okay. But she's right there. If you have uh, anything you can offer for your coffee. There's a little key I had. Oh, the coffee fund. There you go. Oh, you can put your money in there. Right, and um, don't forget we have these stereoscopic uh, photos here on the corner table. Joanne. Right here. I th okay, here it is. If somebody needs to sign up, it'll, it's right there right now. Okay. Otherwise, thank you for being here, and uh, we'll see you next month. Take care.